Thank you, Professor Meislich. The new Jewish visual studies trend has been developing since the early 90s in the study of Jewish art, visual culture, emphasizing the centrality of the crea creators and viewers' identities to interpretation and understanding of the artwork. Based on this view, Suslov stresses that the concept of the Jewish artist means to admit that the ethnicity and religious practice of the artist relates to the pictures or artifacts he makes, whether these may be identified by specific Jewish iconography or not. This paper aims to show how a phenomenological qualitative method using partially structured interviews can contribute to the understanding of Jewish art within its cultural context. Phenomenological research focuses on significance to the research subjects and processes undergrown by the participants themselves. Within a qualitative method, I will demonstrate the importance of the methodological principles of the thematic analysis method. Thematic analysis extricates meaningful categories from the text, as opposed to relying upon previously, previously defined categories. My interview analysis adopts certain components from Gilligan, who established the tradition of verbal analysis. This method specifying, specifies reading and listening to a text on several levels so as to reach a deeper understanding than the first impression. My study implements an important aspect of Gilligan's evaluation method, identifying the characters or themes that are present in the narrative, and more importantly, the characters or themes that are absent from it. Studio of her own, Studio Michelach, is the only alliance of young religious female artists in Israel today, comprising women who create and exhibit together in public spaces. A prominent topic in the group's exhibition is dealing with the body, a practice identified with radical feminist art established in the United States in the 70s. Naamas Nitko Flotan is one of the artists participating in studio of her own. She has uh, created a large body of vaginal artworks while studying at the Bezalel Academy and more intensively as per with, while participating in the, this group. As a case study, this paper will focus on works of Snitko Flotan. The, paper, the present paper attempts to explore the relationship between her artwork and her spiritual, social, religious world. My research questions are, how does the artist view her dealing with the body and sexuality, and how does she cope with the built-in conflict posed by modesty in the religious world? I examine the significant gap between the way the artist speaks on, of her work and what spectators see in it. Snitko Flotan creates mainly drawings and sculptures. Her sculptures are reminiscent of countless feminist works, and the frequent vagina images echo themes of Kant art, the name that Judy Chicago and her students called vaginal art made by feminist artists in the 70s. Costa de Chayuta comprises two thematically related sculptures. The first is a kind of hollow tube with a scabby texture. It is a kind of chimney ascending to the ceiling and descending to the ground, where it opens like a vagina. The second is a large black, brown, and red pillow. This soft piece was made by sewing several small pillows together. The Aramaic title of this work is taken from the Zohar. It means giving life, referring to the moment when a seed decomposes in the earth and produces life. Juxtaposition of the vaginal image 
with the Kabbalistic expression signifying vitality relates to the archetype of the Great Mother, the source of life, another common theme in the 70s feminist art. Hmm? Let's hope the internet works here. Yeah? Give it a minute. The video openings shows fingers, one wearing a ring, feeling a piece of paper, which soon tears, recalling an image of a vagina. The touching becomes fondling, then turns to masturbation. The body and its sexuality, as depicted by American feminist artists, has been extensively researched. These studies focused on how feminist artists dealt with their own body and observed the way these artists understood and presented their work, and also studied the connection between these works and feminist thought. These studies concluded that artists who created vaginal images aimed to celebrate the feminine body and to free women's body from images from the male domination which enslaves it in a patriarchal world. In contrast, my study's findings display a significant divergence between the way the artist speaks of her work and the context the work, uh, of the works that themselves, as most viewers would see them. While Slitko Flotan speaks about her work in the context of childbirth rather than sexuality, nevertheless, the works themselves are of distinctively vaginal forms resembling feminist artistic precedents typically understood in the context of feminine sexuality. In my interview analysis, childbirth emerges as a central theme alongside pregnancy, motherhood, and fear. A general and undirected interview question regarding her work and subjects that appear in it prompts the following response. It changes with time, like also, there are subjects that I always go back to, especially childbirth, pregnancy, and also sexuality, but I think that usually it's connected, like most times when I deal with sexuality, it's usually connected Actually, not always, but many times it's connected to that experience of childbirth and motherhood, and also before it, fears of it, and things that, like that. And often I, my things, I get to subjects, maybe dark things, places of fear, monsters. Usually it seems to me that the two main subjects that are like, end of quote, Childbirth and pregnancy appear prominently here. The artist presents sexuality as related to pregnancy and childbirth in her works, and not as a standalone subject. Even the video openings, which spectators usually interpret as evoking masturbation, is presented by the artist as a work about childbirth. When discussing the link of childbirth and pregnancy with fear, she refers to this particular work to illustrate her point. I asked in response, childbirth, pregnancy, and fear, are they connected to each other, or? Her answer was conclusive, yes. The artist continued, yes. For example, this video, when I did it, I had no intention of doing something sexual. On the contrary, 
It was more to destroy a sort of destructive streak, self-destruction. And then it became something else. By mentioning it in response to a question about pregnancy, childbirth, and fear, the artist defines her work as depicting childbirth and the fears of giving birth, not sexuality, emphasizing that when I did it, I had no intention of doing something sexual. Therefore, even if childbirth does not appear directly in her work, but rather masturbation or self-destruction, these topics are interconnected in the mind of the artist, evoking fear and dark things which she views as related to giving birth. Furthermore, the artist describes her vaginal artworks as not having been intentionally create, created. When showing me a plaster cast used to construct a vaginal work, she said, I didn't think about it. Do you understand? This work wasn't really planned. She added, it's just shapes. It's not that I say, all right, today I'm going to make cunt art. Childbirth emerges as a separate issue in the interview, not necessarily related to the artwork, as the artist describes a childhood attitudes to sexuality. Her account reveals that discussion of sexual intercourse was very restricted in her childhood religious environment, and that it was replaced by the subjects of physiology and childbirth. The hermeneutics of faith, as Josephson puts it, is the interpret effort to examine the various messages inherent in an interview text, giving voice to the various ways to, uh, to the, in, very, in various ways to the participants. While the researcher working from the vantage point of the hermeneutics of suspicion problematize the participant's narrative and strives for explanation beyond the text. In regards to Snitkov Lotan, the hermeneutics of suspicion viewpoint raises the question of whether the artist's upbringing is replicated here as she duplicates a childhood discourse, even though she herself criticizes it, or at least is uncertain about it. Does she find it easier to refer to her works in the birthing context rather than reading them, uh, rather than relating to body parts or sexuality, masturbation, for example? An additional question is whether, although quite aware that spectators interpret her work in sexual terms, she personally prefers to attach different meanings to them. The hermeneutics of faith viewpoint and replication of my position as a male interviewer uh, posits that my clear distinction between sexuality and childbirth as a man for whom childbirth is an impossible experience is a distinction that the artist does not acknowledge at all. How constructed discourse negates this division and combines the two. Semin and Kingsley have stated that American feminist artists has f have formally related to the body beyond the narrow concept of sexuality. And research of feminist art has described the feminine experience as a broader, more encompassing concept of sexuality. The described feminine experience was contrasted to the narrow masculine discourse which regards sexuality mainly from the pleasure perspe perspective. Either way, in my research question, I used the term sexuality as inspired by the vaginal images. I was surprised to discover that the artist regards her works as connected first and foremost to the theme of childbirth. It is difficult to ignore the artist's dismissal of sexuality as, subject, as a subject present in her work. She clearly knows what others see in them, therefore, it would seem that refraining from discussion about sexuality in the interview is linked to the artist's description of the religious environment of her upbringing and her current adult life. It would seem that despite her awareness, and even despite the critical way she describes the, pre, uh, the repressed 
sexual dialogue of her upbringing, she too surrenders to it and duplicates it as the legitimate dimension or the correct way to discuss sexuality. Childbirth is the most prominent interview subject, and other subjects, other contexts of femininity emerge as a flattened voice, soft, minor, and of limited capacity. This, art, this artwork value deepens in light of research conducted among young religious females. Zavid Gross researched the attitudes of female graduates of the religious edu education, education system in Israel to, uh, towards the term gender identity. Testimonial, testimonials of Gross's interviewees show that development and strengthening the gender identity are not part of the religious school's educational agenda. And these subjects do not engage the girls themselves. According to Gross, these girls undergo a socialization process that ignores the physical body and, uh, and its natural needs, while erasing the body as part of the pedagogical configuration of the girl's religious world. The gap between the artist's verbal account of her work as dealing with childbirth and the viewed experience of it as dealing with issues of sexuality may be understood in light of the religious taboo of speaking about sexuality in the artist's community. This gap, therefore, exposes the artist's dual dis discourse. On the one hand, her verbal presentation of the work aligns with the religious world conventions in which discourse about childbirth is common, while discussing sexuality is taboo. On the other hand, her visual uh, on the other hand, her visual, uh, her work communicates another visual message which subverts a religious community's norms by dealing with sexuality throughout. To conclude, artwork work created in traditional cultures facilitates the visibility of subjects that are often omitted in the dominant discourse of these societies. Negone Fal demonstrates how women's artwork in Africa serve as a, as a broad platform for feminist ideas that barely exist outside the world of art. Through this one case study, research with qualitative methods, I demonstrated how art provides a subliminal space which enables the artist to express through materials that which she finds difficult or undesirable to express by words. Thank you. That was a lecture that should provoke questions. Let's see if it did. <laughs> does, does anyone have questions, comments? Yes. I think that you can't uh, not see the parallel between this uh, Lothar, uh, artist and Virginia Woolf, for example. Uh, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. Sorry. <laughs> I was so inside the thing that I kind of, Georgia yeah. uh, O'Keeffe in America, that uh, until her last day uh, said that she didn't do any sexual art mm -hmm. and she, mm -hmm. by the way, never had any children. Uh, and but she did have lots of sex. <laughs> All kinds. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to say is that, that she was a kind of a, the mother of uh, uh, expressionism or uh, in America, in America, uh, abstract expressionism, she was kind of uh, seen as, she was, a, a, she was breaking all kind of rules and still at the end uh, never, never accepted that she did sexual uh, art of her thing. So 
I don't know where to put it. Uh, is that because she wouldn't be able to talk about it? Because she was this, she was quite a um, modern woman. So I don't know how to uh, see that. Is that because uh, finding who I am is part of finding who I am? Or a childbirth? I don't know. Yeah. George O'Keefe was a very uh, free spirit, supposedly, who was about as uptight as you could possibly get. Uh, she was a thoroughgoing wasp uh, at a time when proper Protestant ladies did not talk about certain things. So we're back to the same thing. And you don't have to be Jewish. Uh, you could be Catholic, you can be Protestant, you can be a lot of things. Uh, her upbringing would not have allowed her to talk about things uh, at all. Even uh, if she was having affairs or whatever, you didn't talk about these things. You the, you no, you don't, you don't have affairs. I mean, I'm sleeping with them, but I'm not having an affair. <laughs> you know? Um, it, there's a whole uh, repression going on in a lot of uh, different ways in different cultures. And I think that the, the way that it was explained here uh, is absolutely dead on for Georgia O'Keeffe as well. Now, Judy Chicago will talk about it all the time. <laughs> Any other questions? Nobody? Yes. So maybe I will present Namast in Kofnotam. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, say something that um, I, I know my art is sexual. I don't think it's not. Um, but having a baby has more effect on your vagina than having sex. And so being torn, being so, so and that's, I think that's a fair one. Um, I promise Nama that I won't uh, say she's here until she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody asks questions, that for me, but uh, to Nama, maybe this is a good. I, I will ask you a question. Do you agree with his interpretation? Um, something here. Yeah. Um. You should take notes on that. We have our wizards in interview. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I think that having the, the having babies was, I mean, give labor and, and being torn and sewed are, are very, are, are, and the whole dealing with that, everything changing, that, that's, that's a big part of my work, a lot. The, my body, and that's my um, having sex. I don't know. Like, <laughs> okay, now, I should tell you that art historians often influence artists. Mm -hmm. in, so you better watch out and try to do your own thing and disregard anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to say maybe. I want to say something general about um, the kind of uh, research I was trying to show. Um, and it's connected a, a bit to your good question to the artist. Do you agree with the art historian? Uh, I would say that um, this kind of uh, research is, in its core, uh, postmodern research. That um, is the absolute. Um, it's 
another side that's just very, very far of positivist uh, thinking or positivist research. So uh, researchers who do these research uh, are trying to understand the human experience. Now, when we're thinking about it, if somebody else would come and do the same research and ask the same questions, he could uh, get to uh, different uh, conclusions. And that's OK in these uh, kind of uh, researches, because we get it's another positive, uh, positivistic uh, research. And this, we, we benefit from uh, 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 of, uh, understanding more better the human experience by the different uh, perspectives of the artist and the, uh, of the researcher. And this, of course, uh, makes uh, you have to be very um, aware of what are you doing and all the time think about your uh, standpoint. Uh, and of course, standpoint is maybe the, one of the most important um, uh, elements, concepts in uh, feminist um, uh, research. So, yeah. What he just basically said was that postmodern research is entirely subjective. Uh, you had a question. I was actually going to ask the artist another question. How has your work been responded to by your community? Uh, Most of them? Yeah. Uh, I asked how has what you've been doing to your work? I don't feel like I'm going to do this to you. Recall a long time ago, <coughs> the professor Goldstein, who was a professor of human literature here at Barinam, in the early years of the university, I gave a lecture interpreting a certain essay by Agnon, and Agnon was there. And Agnon said, well, I really didn't intend any of these things. And he said, you weren't aware of the fact. Yeah, I'd like to say a word about the Jordan O.P. Sometimes the cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> <laughs> right? And, you know, it's, uh, when an art historian looks at a work and they interpret it, that doesn't necessarily mean that the artist planned it that way. And I think you have to give the artist the benefit of the doubt. You want to answer? It's a question. I mean, uh, yeah, that, no, I, let, me, let me make a comment on that. First of all, in my experience uh, as an art historian, as opposed to my experience as an artist, uh, in my experience as an art historian, uh, you come up against two different kinds of artists. One who says, no, I never meant that. You know, I, I, it's only my meaning that counts. And one who says, well, if that's what you see in it, then maybe it's there. Uh, so it's subjective from both points of view. Sometimes, uh, I now was present when I gave the lecture this morning, okay? And we have had discussions about my interpretation, her interpretation, well, she'll say, well, no, it was just this, and I'll say, well, but take into consideration this, that, and the next thing. Uh, the, the most shocking one that I ever had was Leonard Baskin, who when I was working on the Holocaust, uh, said to me, no, never influenced, didn't care, couldn't care less, that I said to him, I had a, an hour long conversation, long distance over the telephone with him, and I said, well, take into consideration your Buchenwald poems, the fact that you have an album 
on uh, Holocaust pictures that you collected from all the newspapers and 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 and, and, and at the end of the thing he says, you mean I really all was dealing with the Holocaust? So there's um, different awarenesses that happen because of the different things. And this is why I said before, watch out, because uh, art historians can influence um, artists in the way they then perceive their works. And they back, back away from being true to themselves by trying to either go against what was said or go for what was said. I had now was a perfect example of reacting against criticism. It's the way a woman would do things, so I'll do it heavier. What are you doing so heavy? It should be lighter. I'll do it still heavier. Uh, there's an interplay going on with the environment, and art critics and art historians are part of that environment. But artists have to figure out what they want to do and what they think they mean, and just leave the rest of us to talk. You know, <laughs> there's a difference. I would want to just, uh, maybe I want to say another yeah. word, just to emphasize, emphasis. I was not interpreting the interpreting the art. I was researching our dialogue, and that's a big, big, big difference. Um, I agree that even what I was doing could influence um, Nama or could influence our. Uh, interview, because Nama knew that I'm coming to ask her about sexuality. So uh, I would even, uh, even argue that if I wouldn't bring this subject of sexuality, I wouldn't ask it, maybe it wouldn't be there. Maybe we would only talk about motherhood. So I, I, I just think what's important for these kind of researches and other kind of research uh, that are done today um, uh, that they are not trying to interpret the art, the art but to understand the art with it, within its cultural context. You wanted, there was one more question. Just to come to what he said. Okay. okay. We're going we're to go over time. I see three people that want to talk. Uh, yes. Um, I don't shy away from postmodern methods and tools, but most of the postmodern tools that I use um, have antecedents in, in things like that conversation I just saw, where you two are not actually so far apart in talking about how artists and interpreters deal with the material. But the language of, of describing that very same phenomenon was, was slightly different. Um, it's not the, the language you're using to describe this goes back to say the anthropological turn in history, and I can show places where similar terminology or different terminology is used for the same kinds of interpretation, um, and so the war I think between postmodern and not postmodern, at least where I live in New York, is over, and we don't and we don't have this problem because we understand that the uh, terminology and the methods have long antecedents and it's not scary. And what, what I've heard in a number of contexts today is the, this postmodern versus modern. Modernist. Hey, no, 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 no. I I, I've been postmodern since 1961. <laughs> <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically because I'm, I'm an iconographer. Okay. Uh, my point is when we talk about a positivist interpretation, we've known forever. As, as your dad says, that a positive, as, as Ziva said, that there are many ways to skin the cat. The cat's going to look. The cat that skin is going to look like the interpreter. And so I'm not sure that in discussing this in throughout this culture, and I see it every place I go, there is this generation gap in language, but not in methods. And I just wanted to throw that out. I think the qualitative methods, of course, they came from Clifford Geertz, and it's, it's all there, that's obvious. The, what I was trying to say, that um, maybe in contrast to what Professor Meisley said, that uh, um, within the place I um, 
um, in this um, kind of research, um, the thing is not that um, things that uh, things are subjective. But the, uh, or the point is that every um, uh, research would be subjective. Hi. Uh, David, you have to understand that art is not a confession. <laughs> and if you are talking with the artist before she is an artist, she is a human being, and there is a gap between what she said and what she hides in her work, and the hidden uh, team in the work makes the art better. So sometimes a cigar is a cigar, and sometimes it's not. But well, I'm not asking matter. this question, sorry. Yeah, the question is not, is this a cigar or is this a vaginal work? That's not the question. The questions are to uh, and understand and interpret how the artist uh, explains her work and see, and I showed the gap between, that I could find between them. The questions here are not about the, what is this uh, art. The art could be this and could be that. That's not the question. The question in uh, this kind of uh, research is the, the, the qualitative methods that use uh, interviews. So I'm uh, researching the interview. That, that's what I wanted to say, that actually your interview is a piece of art. That you it's the work. Analyze your own interview and bring in your own agenda by asking certain questions, starting with her sexuality, and then she answers with no. Like your your lecture, she wanted to be more masculine because they expected her to be less. So maybe he, I'm mean, now interpreting my mouth. I don't know if that's fair. <laughs> right? but that's, I concluded from your analysis of your own interview that you started out with certain question. And the response was maybe exactly opposite, stressing the childhood and, and the childbirth and, and uh, fear of pregnancy and not the sexuality that you brought as the first question. If you would start with fear, maybe the answer would be opposite. So actually, you know, here it's not just subjectivity of art that you are analyzing, but you analyze the subjectivity of your own one of, interview. Right? One of the most important and when studying these qualitative methods, and, uh, and, um, one of the most important things is learning how to ask a, ask a question. And there's a whole bibliography, uh, uh, literature about the way to ask uh, questions. And it's something you, yeah, we, you have to um, learn. And um, of course, the questions uh, define uh, the answers. And then uh, when the answers are X, you have to think about, yeah, why, 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 maybe the question. And yourself. maybe why myself as a man who's speaking with and a woman. And it's also, um, of course, question, of right? course. Uh, you have a certain agenda when you're trying to So this was uh, trying to show a methodology in 20 minutes uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, you, you, you have to, uh, I learned for a couple of semesters. And I think to do more of it, uh, yeah, um, there is a lot of more to, what to say. <laughs> OK, last question. Just, just a short comment. I think I'm uh, listening to all this conversation. I really like the, this art historian that actually uh, was checking the artist by talking to her, which means he actually uh, had a uh, common ground with her. Because if you're standing in front of her art, which is done in one language, this is painting. And he is talking about it in a different language, which is means words. Then the result can be different than everybody else. Because the way he sees what he sees out of his own consciousness. And uh, everybody can come and invent the story. And while talking to her, they had a common ground. That's what I wanted to say. OK. Thank you all very much. And uh, we now have a break uh, for not that many minutes, uh, <laughs> because we have used up part of the break. So go get your coffee. <laughs>